Welcome to A Year of War and Peace. I'm your host, Bryony e. Denton. A Year of War and Peace is a daily, year-long, chapter-by-chapter reading of and meditation on Leo Tolstoy's epic novel, War and Peace. In these videos and podcasts, you'll be treated to a free reading of one chapter per day of the novel, plus a reflective essay I've written individually tailored to that day's chapter. These readings are offered for free, though if you'd like to support me, you can do so in one of three ways. First, you could purchase my ebook, A Year of War and Peace. It features the entire novel, plus all of my reflective essays, and it's only $2.99 on Amazon.com. You could also become a patron at patreon.com slash Brian E. Denton. If you sign up there, you'll receive a sonnet once a month, plus a link to an ebook of my collected sonnets. Finally, if you like, you can make a one-time donation to my PayPal account. The email there is brianedenton at gmail.com. You can also use that email to contact me. I'd be happy to hear from you. Your support is greatly appreciated. Today's reading and reflection is on chapter 260. Chapter 260. In Petersburg at that time, a complicated struggle was being carried on with greater heat than ever in the highest circles between the parties of Runyansev the French, Maria Fedorovna the Tsarevich, and others, drowned as usual by the buzzing of the court drones. But the calm, luxurious life of Petersburg, concerned only about phantoms and reflections of real life, went on in an old way, and made it hard, except by a great effort, to realize the danger and the difficult position of the Russian people. There were the same receptions and balls, the same French theater, the same court interests, and service interests, and intrigues as usual. Only in the very highest circles were attempts made to keep in mind the difficulties of the actual position. Stories were whispered of how differently the two empresses behaved in these difficult circumstances. The Empress Maria, concerned for the welfare of the charitable and educational institutions under her patronage, had given directions that they should all be removed to Kassan, and the things belonging to these institutions had already been packed up. The Empress Elizabeth, however, when asked what instructions she would be pleased to give, with her characteristic Russian patriotism, had replied that she could give no directions about state institutions, for that was the affair of the sovereign. But as far as she personally was concerned, she would be the last to quit Petersburg. At Anna Pavlovna's on the 26th of August, the very day of the Battle of Borodino, there was a soiree, the chief feature of which was to be the reading of a letter from his lordship the bishop when sending the emperor an icon on the venerable Sergius. It was regarded as a model of ecclesiastical, patriotic eloquence. Prince Vasily himself, famed for his elocution, was to read it. He used to read at the empresses. The art of his reading was supposed to lie in rolling out the words, quite independently of the meaning, in a loud and sing-song voice, alternating between a despairing wail and a tender murmur, so that the wail fell quite at random on one word and the murmur on another. This reading, as was always the case in Anna Pavlovna's soirees, had a political significance. That evening, she expected several important personages, who had to be made ashamed of their visits to the French theater and aroused to a patriotic temper. A good many people had already arrived, but Anna Pavlovna, not yet seeing all those whom she wanted in her drawing room, did not let the reading begin, but wound up the springs of a general conversation. The news of the day in Petersburg was the illness of Countess Bezakova. She had fallen ill unexpectedly a few days previously, had missed several gatherings of which she was usually the ornament, and was said to be receiving no one, and instead of the celebrated Petersburg doctors who usually attended her, had entrusted herself to some Italian doctor who was treating her in some new and unusual way. They all knew very well that the enchanting countess's illness arose from an inconvenience resulting from marrying two husbands at the same time, and that the Italian's cure consisted in removing such inconvenience. But in Anna Pavlovna's presence, no one dared to think of this, or even appear to know it. They say the poor countess is very ill. The doctor says it is angina pectoris. Angina? Oh, that's a terrible illness. They say that the rivals are reconciled, thanks to the angina and the word Angina was repeated with great satisfaction. The Count is pathetic, they say. He cried like a child when the doctor told him the case was dangerous. Oh, it would be a terrible loss. She is an enchanting woman. You are speaking of the poor Countess, said Anna Pavlovna, coming up just then. 
I sent to ask for news and hear that she is doing a little better. Oh, she is certainly the most charming woman in the world, she went on, with a smile at her own enthusiasm. We belong to different camps, but that does not prevent my esteeming her as she deserves. She is very unfortunate, added Anna Pavlovna. Supposing that by these words Anna Pavlovna was somewhat lifting the veil from the secret of the Countess's malady, an unwary young man ventured to express surprise that well-known doctors had not been called, and that the Countess was being attended by a charlatan who might employ dangerous remedies. Your information may be better than mine, Anna Pavlovna suddenly and venomously retorted to the inexperienced young man, but I know on good authority that this doctor is a very learned and able man. He is a private physician to the Queen of Spain. And having thus demolished the young man, Anna Pavlovna turned to another group, where Bilibin was talking about the Austrians. Having wrinkled up his face, he was evidently preparing to smooth it out again and utter one of his mots. I think it is delightful, he said, referring to a diplomatic note that had been sent to Vienna with some Austrian banners captured from the French by Wittgenstein. The hero of Petropol, as he was then called in Petersburg. What? What's that? asked Anna Pavlovna, securing silence for the mot which she had heard before. And Bilibin repeated the actual words of the diplomatic dispatch, which he had himself composed. The emperor returns these Austrian banners, said Bilibin. Friendly banners gone astray and found on a wrong path. And his brow became smooth again. Charming, charming, observed Prince Vasily. The path to Warsaw, perhaps, Prince Ippolit remarked loudly and unexpectedly. Everybody looked at him, understanding what he meant. Prince Ippolit himself glanced around with amused surprise. He knew no more than the others what his words meant. During his diplomatic career, he had more than once noticed that such utterances were received as very witty, and at every opportunity he uttered in that way the first words that entered his head. It may not turn out very well, he thought, but if not, they'll know how to arrange matters. And really, during the awkward silence that ensued, that insufficiently patriotic person entered whom Anna Pavlovna had been waiting for, and wished to convert, and she, smiling and shaking a finger at Ippolit, invited Prince Vasily to the table, and bringing him two candles and the manuscript, begged him to begin. Everyone became silent. Most gracious sovereign and emperor, Prince Vasily sternly declaimed, looking round at his audience, as if to inquire whether anyone had anything to say to the contrary, but no one said anything. Moscow, our ancient capital, the New Jerusalem, receives her Christ. He placed a sudden emphasis on the word her, as a mother receives her zealous sons into her arms, and through the gathering mists, foreseeing the brilliant glory of thy rule, sings in exultation, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh. Prince Vasily pronounced these words in a tearful voice. Beliebin attentively examined his nails, and many of those present appeared intimidated, as if asking in what they were to blame. Anna Pavlovna whispered the next words and advanced, like an old woman muttering the prayer of communion. Let the bold and insolent Goliath, she whispered. Prince Vasily continued, Let the bold and insolent Goliath from the borders of France encompass the realms of Russia with death-bearing terrors. Humble faith, the sling of Russian David, shall suddenly smite his head in his bloodthirsty pride. This icon of the venerable Sergius, the servant of God and zealous champion of our old country's wheel, is offered to your imperial majesty. I grieve that my waning strength prevents rejoicing in the sight of your most gracious presence. I raise fervent prayers to heaven that the Almighty may exalt the race of the just and mercifully fulfill the desires of your majesty. What force, what a style, was uttered in approval, both of reader and of author. Animated by that address, Anna Pavlovna's guest talked for a long time of the state of the fatherland and offered various conjectures as to the result of the battle to be fought in a few days. You will see, said Anna Pavlovna, that tomorrow, on the Emperor's birthday, we shall receive news. I have a favorable presentiment. All right, that concludes my reading of chapter 260. I'll now proceed to my reflection on the same. A Year of War and Peace Day 260. Life is Ball. We open this chapter the same as we did the first, to find ourselves at one of Anna Pavlovna's soirees. It's curious to know just how little seems to have changed. Most of the same people are there, 
There's plenty of food and drink. Gossip reigns. Further, a topic of conversation remains the trouble with Napoleon, although the talk is more heightened and nationalistic given recent developments. Aside from the more patriotic flavor of the party, however, it's tough to distinguish between the two soirees. This is striking. The nation, after all, is under attack from Europe's preeminent military power, and yet, we're told that, quote, there were the same receptions and balls, the same French theater, the same count interest and service interest and intrigues as usual, end quote. This is a powerful response to adversity. It's not that the people of Petersburg are totally indifferent to the dangers of a French occupation, but rather, they're indifferent to those parts of the occupation they have no control over. So, for instance, we see that the two empresses do all they can to address the French invasion. The Dowager Empress Maria, concerned about her educational and charitable institutions, orders them to be packed up and moved to Kassan. Empress Elizabeth, wishing to set an example of fortitude, declares that she will be the last person to quit Petersburg. The aristocracy is similarly indifferent to the French invasion. Anna Pavlovna obviously still hosts her soirees. Prince Vasily still attends them. Party talk, just as it was before, is of gossip and news. The main topic of conversation is Helene's illness. Doesn't look good for her. Aside from that, Prince Vasily reads a patriotic letter from the Lordship Bishop. Things seem fairly normal. This reaction to what fate has handed our characters is commendable. In the face of a seemingly inevitable French onslaught, they refuse to break down in panic. They choose to remain calm and carry on. Having been dealt a bad hand, they nevertheless play it to the best of their abilities. That's worth emulating. Daily Meditation This is just what you see those doing who play a ball skillfully. No one cares about the ball as being good or bad, but about throwing and catching it. Socrates then knew how to play ball. How? By using pleasantry in the court when he was tried. Tell me, he says. Anitus, how do you say that I do not believe in God? The diamonds, the demons, who are they, think you? Are they not sons of gods, or compounded of gods and men? When Anitus admitted this, Socrates said, Who then think you can believe that there are mules, half asses, but not asses? And this he said as if he were playing a ball. And what was the ball in this case? Life, chains, banishment, a drought of poison, separation from wife, and leaving children orphans. These were the things which he was playing. But still he did play, and threw the ball skillfully. So we should do. We must employ all the cares of the players, but show the same indifference about the ball. Epictetus, The Discourses Alright, that concludes my reading and reflection on chapter 260 of War and Peace. I hope you liked it. Thanks so much for listening. Remember that if you'd like to support me, you can do so either by purchasing the ebook, A Year of War and Peace, becoming a patron at patreon.com, or making a one-time donation to PayPal. The links to all of that are below. Your support is greatly appreciated. Tomorrow we'll be reading and reflecting on chapter 261 of War and Peace. I hope you'll join me. Until then, take care of yourselves and others.